And I would like to invite uh, Professor Shalom Elitzur, who is a physicist at the Center of Quantum Studies at Chapman University. His psychological publications span across religion, humor, and suicide prevention. Welcome, Shalom. Thank you very much, uh, Yurit and Eli, for this honor of uh, sharing with you a wild hypothesis, which I'm sure I'm going to thoroughly revise following this encounter. I'll begin with a personal experience. Haven't found in Google a illustration for a non-erotic kiss between males, so I had to go to our Bnei Dodim, to, to our uh, uh, Palestinian or Arab neighbors. Uh, here is the exper experience. I walk in the street and then somebody calls my name. I turn around and I see a friend whom I haven't seen for a long time. And he calls me and greets me and approaches me and then stretches his hand. We shake hands. And then, much to my surprise, he uh, he pulls me, uh, gives me a hug and then a kiss. And it's an interesting uh, experience. Now, what, what happens here? Uh, a lot of emotions, so we can guess what happened. Uh, there has been something in outer reality. I've, uh, there, there was an encounter between two humans. And then information came to the eyes, to the ears, uh, to, to all the other sense organs, went into the brain and integrated to this affectionate uh, meeting between uh, two people, right? No, it's not, it's not the case because I've been dreaming. This has been a dream. Now, how can I account now for what has happened uh, in terms of the hierarchy between senses and then the experience itself? It's a bit difficult. Here I take a theory of dreams, which I thoroughly dislike by Hobson and Macaulay, who try to say that there is no meaning in dreams. And what Hobson would say mm -hmm. is that probably it's my, it's, it was my um, uh, brainstem, which sent random signals to the visual cortex, which later made a story. This is the synthesis activation story. And for many years, uh, Hobson wiggled in order to, uh, trying to resist any Freudian or any meaning to, to the dream until he confessed that yes, but we still infuse something of our personality and of our own life uh, into, into the story of the dream. But in this case, it's impossible because the dream was not only visual, it was auditory, first auditory, then visual, then tactile, then olfactory, then all, all, all the kinds of, of senses that integrated back. So I can't say that there has been some random signaling from the brainstem to the uh, occipital, I guess, to the uh, visual cortex, and then to the hearing cortex, and then to the olfactory. And by some miracle, they all converged into the same story of meeting between friends. So there is something different. Probably the hierarchy was different, was, was reverse. First the concept and then the sense data which were supposed to be integrated into it, which, which is more likely this is what was happening. Here's another case, less happy one. This woman is pregnant. Great, she has a swollen abdomen, she is lactating, probably her face is radiant, she is so beautiful. Everything is prepared to the birth. And again, we can, guess what has happened? There's been an impregnation happily and then pregnancy going to all the systems of the endocrine systems and then the reproductive and so on and giving rise to pregnancy, right? Alas, no, this is cytosiasis and this uh, unfortunate woman was just kind of uh, phantom pregnancy and she was imagining it. In this case, it nearly necessitated a caesarean section. It was so real to, to the obstetrician that everybody believed that there, she was feeling the fetus with, within her. And then you have to tell her that there, there was nothing there and it was only in her imagination and all the signs of pregnancy uh, sadly disappeared. Once again, so we have... We, we are amazed by the integrative capability of the mind, what people would call later psychoanalysts, the synthetic function of the ego to synthesize, to make such an elaborate story, how ingenious we are in inventing all these stories, whether these are 
uh, dreams, whether these are uh, hysterical symptoms, whether these are psychosis. I'm thinking about Schreiber's case, how all the apparently crazy uh, delusions and hallucinations converge into one very solid and very logical idea. And to this guy, we all the, the thought that probably indeed something was reversed here. He, he believed that it is a wish. There is some wish in the dream. The wish then later creates what should have been the building blocks from it. Now, here's my question, and it may sound to you dumb. If we are so ingenious in creating these internal realities, if these are self-inflicted, that is, all the neurosis, how come, I'm taking, for example, the case of uh, uh, functional somatic symptoms, uh, conversive symptoms, how come that all uh, these symptoms which I find are unpleasant. You have pain in the bowels, you have irritable bowels, you have back pain, you have this pain, that pain, uh, all the question, all the possible questions that you can think about. How come that there is no hysterical sensation of having ice cream in your mouth? How come that there is no obsession about being caressed by somebody? I mean, in all the obsessions and compulsions, it is anxiety which always threatens you and then you feel relief, but there is nothing pleasant in, in, the, in the neurosis itself. The only cases in which I think give you pleasure, you have to go to the end of the psychiatric scale, whether to mania, to megalomania, or in the case which Oliver Sacks describes, that fortunate woman who, by a lesion, always hears the most beautiful uh, pieces of classical music. But we, normal neurotics, why on earth are we so miserable? Why can't we give ourselves good time with all these neuroses that we go? And later Freud would come with a super ego and so on. But even the wish fulfillment in the dreams, it is rare. Usually in order to find the wish fulfillment, you have to do what we say in Hebrew, to, to dig and dig until you see that there, there was some wish there. Why is it so? So I think that this is strange. And here is another strange thing. You know this Viennese guy. So Frankel, he was the founder of the psychotherapy called Logotherapy, in which he argued that uh, we need meaning. Just as we need love, just as we have physical needs, we need meaning. Uh, I should actually have brought here another picture of uh, Schreiber, just in order to show that this is actually what paranoia gives you, meaning, too much meaning. For the paranoic, nothing is coincidental. Everything, these are the reference, delusions, Schreiber says, everything which happens, happens in relation to me. I am important. Don't, don't dismiss me. I am I'm the center of the universe. So uh, humans need meaning. And then Frankel, which was another genius, like all these people who came from, from Vienna, uh, proposed the, the following idea, which is very technical. When a patient suffering with some neurotic symptom comes to you and presents a neurotic symptom, you can instruct him to do the following. Try to show the symptom. T try to exercise it. Please do blush. Please do stammer. Please do present your tics. And he argued that in many cases, lo and behold, the neurotic symptom dissolved. How is it so? When I looked for the efficacy of this uh, therapy, the, there was not much evidence in, in the form of Frankel, but negative practice. There is a book on the subject, there is a good review, and in some cases, even Gilles de la, even Tourism, it looks like when you are not resisting the symptom, but just manifesting it happily, and, and you want to do it, then again, uh, somehow it dissolves, it loses, it is robbed of its compulsive force. And it, once again, how is it so? I can recall a problem which made my own childhood miserable. You have a seasickness or motion sickness and the child keeps crying. You can't put them on a car because they vomit and they have nausea and so on and so on. In some cases, and this is hereditary, you have to wait until the age of 16 or something like that. And then it vanishes for a very interesting reason. That boy or girl now learned to drive. And what they are doing in, in Fridays, you don't want to think about. Lo and behold, they are not nauseating anymore. Here is another case. And there is a man, I won't mention his name, who once took his nephew. He just couldn't see the boy vomiting so much in family circumstances. So he took him where his brother and his sister-in-law couldn't see it with his car, put him on his lap and said, look, now I'm driving. You hold the, the, the wheel you, you hold, and, and tell me whether you, you have nausea or not. 
he didn't have it's not that i what this guy did was really shouldn't shouldn't be done but here is another interesting thing and as you can see two israeli guys actually are asking why is the driver uh, rally motion sick and again here is a question which you understand that is joining to to the few other questions that I, that i'm asking this man is a genius, and uh, let me guess, he will never get the Nobel Prize because the people in Stockholm would feel really silly to give the Nobel Prize for medicine and physiology for this Indian guy who did not invent a new surgical technique. He did not discover another molecule or another kind of treatment or something like that. He just used a mirror. Why do you need a mirror in order to cure people of one of the worst things that can happen to, to a person who has undergone um, amputation? It is not only that he doesn't have a limb now, which has been amputated due to some horrible reason, but they feel pain in the, in the organ, which is now missing. I, I recall the, the most uh, touching case of an Indian 16 years old boy who had a palsy and his thumb was protruding his, his palm. And then uh, he, he had to cut the nail every once in a while. And when he neglected to do that in, in the conditions there in Southern India, there was an infection and they had to uh, amputate the entire palm. So this guy is now not only that he doesn't have his, his hand, but he still feels that thumb going protruding and giving him terrible pain. And what Vilayanur uh, Subramanian Ramachandran, it's worth breaking our teeth for uh, the name of this genius. So what he did is just place a mirror and say, here's your left hand, here is your right hand, the one which gives you so much misery. Now can you squeeze both hands? Can you do something with the two hands? Imagine that you are in an orchestra and you are the conductor and so on. And this boy calls him and say, Doc, after nine years, my phantom pain uh, has, has evaporated. And this is now in, in heavy use, even in Israel. So how could he do that? Here is a paper in which I think that Ramachandran is coming close to, to what I'm proposing. And what I'm proposing is uh, something known. I happen to live in a, in a house in which there are more animals than humans. So uh, sorry for taking uh, th this example. But at the best, uh, it was introduced by Erich von Helst, even earlier by Helmholtz, but then later Austrian zoologist Erich, uh, Erich von Helst and some others. And this is the reafference mechanism. So rather than describing to you the experiments done in, uh, in animals, here is a simple way that you can uh, uh, observe on yourself uh, what is reappearance? You close one eye and you look at some distant object or even to me, and then with your hand, you slightly pull the, uh, the skin next to the eye, which is open. You will see me flicking, moving slightly to the side. And the reason is simple. You have actually moved your entire, your entire eye when you looked at me. So just when the eye moved to, to the side, then I was moving to the other side. Now here comes the question. How come that it doesn't happen every time that I'm moving my eye voluntarily? This is the reafference uh, principle, and it goes the following. That center of the brain, which sends the order to the eyes to move from one side to the other, sends a copy to the occipital cortex saying, now the world is going to move. You just have to correct it in order to, to leave it in its place. So this is actually something that we keep doing all the time. We are, try we, we are showing, we are exerting reafference all the time in order to, uh, to prevent our own actions from affecting our perceptions. And here is the question, and I'm got now going back to the dream. You remember that passage in Freud's The Interpretation of Dreams, which is somewhere at the middle of the book. Freud begins with a very tedious and boring review of uh, all their theories of the dream. Then he brings some of his own dreams, the idea of free associations. And then towards the middle of, of the book, he says, you know, for some years, I'm engaged in trying to understand some psychopathological formations. And I found that there is something called the unconscious and you reconstruct how it has been evolved through childhood, childhood trauma and so on. And then he says something which is, I think, the, the most uh, so uplifting. I found out that the resolution of these riddles is also resolves the conflict. 
So the cognitive, the intellectual work of understanding how this uh, neurosis, obsession, compulsion uh, has evolved gives you the opportunity to get rid of the symptoms. This is, of course, a very optimistic claim. He would later have to give some reservations. There will be a resistance. There will be friends, friends, and so on. But this is what guides you, I guess, most of the psychotherapists here that actually brings you the, the very idea of understanding what happens, enables you to get rid or to overcome uh, or to overcome the symptom. Is it possible? Uh, to my surprise, to my somewhat disappointment, but also I, I was ha very happy to see that when you think about uh, hallucinations, psychotic hallucinations, here these two guys actually assume that hallucination is a kind of failure to uh, uh, of the reafference principle. Here is a thought of mine, here is a fantasy of mine, here is some fear, some wish of mine, which... It, it is my own doing. Somehow I cannot, the brain fails to tell the other parts of the, of uh, its other parts, say visual or auditory, that it is its own doing. And then this is how they are experienced as heteropsychic rather than inner psychic. The, the mechanism here is very interesting, and but you, you can uh, f find it for yourself. For uh, here it is, and I think that my, my lecture will be much shorter and I will leave uh, time for questions. Is it possible that when you have an insight which explains to you why you are doing something, actually, let me take one more example, which is not in the slides in order to, to explain to you what I, what, what I have in mind. Think about what Ladu is proposing about the role of the amygdala. The amygdala has uh, stores the traumatic experience. And then after a while, you remember the, the experiment with, with the rat, when you sever the pathway between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, then it turns out the amygdala never forgets anything. It is the prefrontal cortex who goes down to the amygdala through the pathway and say, I understand that I cannot obliterate the, the traumatic experience, but here I am, I'm ordering you by some hierarchy, just like Babinski reflex is being suppressed by the older reflex. It goes down and say, now I'm in command. And when it is removed, then you have the release. Is it possible that when we have insight, actually the, our brain is telling us, hey, it's my own doing. These persecutory delusions, I need Tsumi. How would you translate Tsumi? I need some attention. I need some affection. But you don't have to go into delusions for that. I was looking for the efficacy of all kinds of, of uh, psychotherapies. And much to my surprise, I am not a therapist. I found that psychodrama has among the best and most encouraging and most encouraging rates of success. And it's interesting because in psychoanalysts usually are not happy about enactments. I remember my own shrink every time I was enacting, it was really, you have to interpret it. But sometimes they see it as very good opportunity to work through something. Is it possible that this amazing success, when I was reviewing uh, for this lecture, all kinds of treatment, is it possible that this is the source of psychodrama, that there is a lot of psychoanalysis, psychodynamics going on, but it is the action which actually, according to if my hypothesis is correct, gives you some kind of free affairs. Let me tell you that after many years that I teach this uh, uh, method in class, I don't see you flicking because my my brain got tired. Say, so, oh, he's going again with his finger. So don't, don't take it seriously. So I think that I have a kind of free affairs myself. You want some predictions and I will, will be very brief. I'll just mention the first one to the doctors among you. You sometimes do you prescribe placebo? Here's what you can do. If you prescribe placebo, tell the patient, I don't know whether it will work, but if it will work, your pain will become worse. Your itching will become worse. That will be the sign that it is working. I'm not sure about it. I don't know whether it is ethical, but here is something that you can try. Make the patient for once in their life, wish for the pain to come, wish for the distress to come, I have something thinking about uh, stammering and negative practice or EMDR, but this I will do after I, I hear you, and I guess that we will be able to present papers to this meeting, so I will we'll have time to revise it. Thank you very much for this opportunity.